up in, back again. Mike starts to speak, Greg cuts in. Read, Read all about, about it. it, tell a friend. Paper's time won't ever end. Paper's time with Greg and Mike. Gonna tell you all about it. Gonna tell you all about it. Wow, didn't even count. Three, two, one. There's that. Read all about oh, it. Wait, wait. Read oh, all wait. about I it. Wouldn't, I wouldn't do Hot that. Hot news coming from underwater. Glug, 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 help, help. There we go. Welcome to Sunday Papers. Here we are, everybody. Here we are. Hey, hey now. Look at it. Fix my audio issue, I think. I guess there was a little audio issue last week with my Yeah, yeah. I guess there was a little echo. Hot. Your phones were too hot. Um, Door. Yes. I'm going to... I'm going to, uh, we're getting new microphones, apparently. Uh, Chris Denman's got some kind of contact, and he's going to hook us up with some high-end mic. I don't know why we don't have better microphones to begin with. This is such a slap shot operation. Uh, uh, I, think, I think it's part of our charm. Now, you gave me this microphone. This is, right. this is a legendary SM58 Sure a microphone. Sure. and. Yeah has a dent in it. I'm wondering if this is maybe the one you hit a guy <clears throat> over the head with uh, in a club that time. Simpka. That's right. Don't ever charge the stage when I'm up there. <laughs> I had a guy last night get pretty pissed off at me. Um, and I did, I banged him in the head with the microphone a couple times just as a joke. Oh, and, uh, wait, and he are got you joking? Angry. Are you joking now? No, I'm serious. I, I mean, I didn't slam him. I just... I just the funny thing with the microphone is if you just tap somebody, it makes a huge noise like you're slamming in the head. Yes. And so he got kind of self conscious about it, and then <laughs> uh, and then he shit on me, which was really fun because he was a pilot. And I had said during my set, I said, you know, uh, I said your next three comics. I go, Mark Marin was just on. He went to BU. I'm on, I went to BU, and next is Jeff Ross, who also went to BU. Like, we all went to BU at the same time. Mark and Jeff were a little older than me, but they graduated w within a couple of years. I forgot so I Mark went there, yeah. Yeah, so I said that, and then uh, I was shitting on the guy. I hit him in the head with the microphone, and then it turns out he's a pilot. And I said, what kind of pilot? And he goes, private. He goes, but you wouldn't know about that. Ask Mark and Jeff. <laughs> That's pretty funny. I know. That's solid. And I'll tell you something. When an audience member scores on me, I'm the first one to give it up and be like, you know, I, uh, I laugh. That's laughed. great. I don't try to top it. Just let them have it. Yeah. No, that's great. That's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. Um, maybe you christened them. Maybe there was some magic in that mic. Right. Yeah, it's right. like united them. <laughs> um, I, I totally forgot you were in town. Like you, we just turned on the zoom and I'm expecting a depressing, uh, hotel room. I, I guess it's because you couldn't make, you were working yesterday, which is very rare. And then I just assumed you're out of town. <laughs> and then last, by the way, so Gubbins invites me last night over to Penmar, uh, cause they have a huge music night. I mean, you could go on the Penmar Instagram account. It's, it's like Dude, LA the line was. Out the door, through the parking lot, and then about three, about two hundred yards down Rose Avenue. It's so like people. Los Angeles's effort at being Ibiza. It's right. it's the most trendy looking crowd ever. All these, you know, the hot chicks with their giant stupid hats. Anyway, it's um and packed with douchebags. But Govin's like, come on over, JoJo will get you in. I'm like, what? And so I drive over. He's like, just text us when you're, you know, or right outside. JoJo Where comes. Where did you park? There's no parking. I parked across the baseball fields. People don't need to hear this. So anyway, uh, JoJo comes out, your daughter, with a wristband, puts it on, makes sure, explains to people that she's walking me in, gets me in. Could not have been cooler. I'm like, is this going to be? No shit, really? I'm like, is this going to be an insane night for you? And she's like, no, I get off. I get six, which was like a half hour away or whatever. Uh -huh. So anyway, at one point, I'm at a table with Dennis and a lot of the uh, really funny guys, improv guys and actors. And and anyway, uh, I'm like, does anyone want a drink? I'm going up. And then they're like, yeah, maybe get a picture for the table. I'm like, fine. So <clears throat> on my way up to the inside bar, I'm going to go get a picture and JoJo's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, yeah, and I'm going to pitch her. And she's like, oh, puts her arm around me, walks me up to the front and goes, this is my dad's best friend. And the dudes totally hooked me up. They gave you a free picture? Free picture. And, <laughs> and 
I got a pitcher and then I got like two other drinks that people like, you know, one was a soda. Or, but anyway, and so they had to bill me something. So the bill came and it was like seven bucks and you know how expensive I think. For, yeah. So it was like seven bucks. So I'm like, oh my God. So I tipped 10 uh -huh. and, and, and thanked them. But Joe Dilly just saw me across the came over and just took charge. It was so cool. So a little later on, Dennis, we're online with Dennis. We get to the front, and uh, the guy's like, oh, man, no, I'll hook you up. I'm like, oh, wow, is this a JoJo hookup again? And Gubbins gets angry. This should be good news for Gubbins. <laughs> Gubbins gets angry and looks at me. Meanwhile, we're ordering two margaritas. And Gubbins gets angry. He's like, no, it's because he knows me. I'm like, oh, all right, whatever. As long as we're getting hooked up. And the guy goes, yeah, I'm going to hook you up with doubles anyway, you know, and not charge you for the doubles. I'm like, great. I get the bill. I go immediately to tip $10 again, press pay, and realize they charged me $34 for the two drinks. No. Yes, that's Gubbin's hookup compared to, jo ah. compared to JoJo's. $34. And we, I paid $44 for two double uh, margaritas, which I think was the charge for two single margaritas, if we're to believe them. And how much 34. would you have tipped on $34? Huh? How much would you have tipped on $34? No, here's what I do, because tipping is clearly out of control everywhere. You know, they put in the automatic 15% of this. I tip a dollar a drink. Sorry. That's just standard. That's what's happening. Wow. Yeah. So you so like some restaurants will fr they'll have one night of the year where they freeze their prices at 1958. So you've frozen your tipping at 1974? Listen, when you if it, if you're getting like I mean, listen, dr drinks. Yes, I do think of a drink as ten bucks, a dollar for for a bartender to pour a vodka soda. I, I don't know. I don't think that's that bad. Yeah. All right. You know, in restaurants, you know, when you order a six hundred dollar bottle of wine versus a sixty dollar bottle of wine, are you really supposed to tip a uh, hundred and twenty dollars? Yeah. Uh, on a six hundred dollar bottle of wine, that's ridiculous. Ridiculous. No, as a matter of fact, the the real rule on tipping is 18%, but uh, not on alcohol and tax. Right. That's, that is the New York formula for tipping. And you add a few for the drinks, I guess. But yeah, I mean, 20%, especially on expensive wine, and no yeah. way. Right. Same so, amount of work uncorking a shitty bottle. So were there just gorgeous women everywhere? That is correct, sir. Yeah, yeah. like, I was but at one of those also ones, ridiculous. I it. It's yeah. like it's like all the images you see online of influencers in Tulum, you know, uh -huh. like just crazy amount of skin exposed with like tattoos up the side of the torso, uh huh, you know, and writing in like a, a, around the rib cage and uh, and everyone trying to out goofy. By the way, they're not intentionally being goofy but the goofy hats yeah. are they're just out of control right um, um but well, really gonna, good music really good music though was great speaking of penmar we're going to be auctioning off a uh, a tea time with us fitzsimmons fitzgibbons gibbons and gubbins and if you want to be our they play five sums at penmar you're going to be our fifth we're going to pay for your greens fees we're going to take you to lunch take some photos have some memories, do some betting with Gubbins, get to see up close what makes this guy tick. Uh, and we're raising money for the Entertainment Community Fund. And uh, the the fund is called uh, WGA Rage. So it's W-G-A-R-A-G-E. -E. And uh, it's all going to be online. We'll let you know. We'll put a link on the site once it's live. But I think I've heard it gonna... described as W Garage also. Okay. Maybe that's it. But uh, so it'll be a date that works for you. If you're coming from out of town or if you're a local, then uh, we, we, anytime we're, we're around. Are people really going to buy this? They, <laughs> the way they've heard uh, us talk about it, like they pay yeah. to fucking have an unpleasant walk <laughs> of nine holes. <laughs> While Gubbins yells at the group in front of you to the point where you might have a fist fight oh, with a bunch of old Korean men. We were out there for the usual Friday morning yesterday, and uh, he had dialogue going with the group in front of us. And not only the group in front of us, of course, four groups ahead of us. I also yelled, play him up. It was the most crowd I've ever seen. The worst. But he had a dialogue going with the group behind us as well. 
And what kind of dialogue? We're trying to teach these old ladies what play up means. And it was a whole, it was wild to watch. And then, um, anyway, and at one point, a guy mistook his tone and there was some tension, but they then cleared it up after the next hole. Jesus Christ. It what was is fine. His problem. No, he I was mean, right. I have to say, and yeah, and yelling. Right in what way? Just stay in your own group. No, you don't need they, to interact they, with other There was groups. such a cluster. People don't understand the play it up thing, and it really does help. Yeah. All right. Anyway, um, but uh, regarding Gibbons, Gubbins, and Fitzsimmons and all, I I went. I told you I played the best public course in L.A. In my opinion, Rancho, and I'm intimidated. It's an 18 hole, and the L.A. Open was there one year, and so I go and I like check in. I'm like, oh, I'm here for the whatever the nine o'clock uh, Gibbons, and there's like from the famous Gibbons, Gubbins, Fitzsimmons, for Gibbons. Oh Fitzsimmons. no shit! And I'm really? like. I'm like, what? I go, how have, I was like, has word spread? Like, what do you, and it was this Asian guy, and I guess he used to be the starter at Penmar. Oh, no shit. And he rem- he remembered us. Like, it, like, it is absurd. That's hilarious. So anyway, we're you're, you're joining a famous foursome uh, if you do this auction thing. or whatever. What is it, auction? It's an auction, and it's raising money for uh, below-the-line people, like assistants in production, people that don't make a lot of money that are really getting hit by the strike. It's right. not for the writers. It's for, like, you know, assistant grips and people like that. So right. uh, our friend Kit Boss is running it, and details will come. I want to give a huge shout-out to uh, Ka- Callie Khan for rake- making the logo this week. It's like... It's psychedelic. It's very cool. It's very cool. How, how would you describe that? I know. I think there are some influences in there. Well, it has Funhouse up there. And remember uh, remember Smigel's TV oh, Funhouse. Funhouse? Yeah, right, right. And then, yeah, that Matt, it looks like a 1967 concert poster for yeah. like... Uh, Jefferson Starship or something. Yeah, the Sunday papers part above your head, which is a wild drawing of you, is very psychedelic. And Blondie is looking very hot, I have to say. I think Hagger's about to have his way with her. Yes, he is. He's got a sight line on her. Uh, this week's song was also amazing. From really Hop. great song. Really great lyrics, and you can listen to the whole thing at the end because we obviously can't play the entire song before each show, but the, the show always ends with the full the full song. So uh, thank you for that, Ha. I hope I got your name wrong. It seemed like it was from Ha. A lot of corrections this week. Oh, you're kidding. On the th- June 3rd Sunday papers, there was a correction about Volkswagen Automotive Group. Uh, yes, VW owns a bunch of other car companies, Audi, Porsche, Skoda. What? But you left out the other brands they own that are way more interesting. Bugatti, Lamborghini, Bentley, and Ducati. Wow. What? Germans own Lamborghini and Bugatti? They build it. They build the $2 million 16-cylinder quad-turbo Bugatti supercar. That's from Dan in Vancouver. Huh. Dan Coover. That's like Nabisco. You know, when you look at what they really own. Yeah. Or Procter Gamble. Like, it's it's insane, the, the corporate mergers that have happened over the last 10 years. And Johnson & Johnson owns Volkswagen, so it even gets crazier. All right. Uh, Brian G says, writing in with a correction on your Irish sailors conversation, (laughs) actually multiple corrections. There are a couple of famous Irish sailors. Gibbon said there were none, perhaps most notably Ernest Shackleton. Figures. Marooned while exploring Antarctica. Yeah, he got frozen. He got frozen. His boat got frozen in the ice. Yeah. Um, Mike then asked if there were any Majorcan sailors, and Greg offered Marco Polo. <laughs> Not only was Marco Polo Venetian, he was he very famously took the land route across Asia and didn't sail there. <laughs> but the confidence with which you offer that, your incorrect information is so admirable. Is that is the key. Yeah. Uh, Amanda Liebson says it's not graduate college, it's graduate from college. Oh. Please add the word from after you use the word graduate. I think it's actually what was gra- graduated from. 
All right, we have a story that I put in in Florida about a new dialect down there, but it's interesting. It talks about things like this, like all yeah. these terms and, you know, getting uh, whatever. We'll, we'll, th- there's interesting phrases, and it's, and it's because it's a hybrid of two languages. And so, yeah, she's right, I know, but, I mean, that could fade, graduate college. Well, it sounds like yeah. graduate college. Dave from Long Beach said uh, Mike's story about Ariton Ar- Senna was very close to correct. Oh. He mentioned the track as Monaco, but it was from the Dallas, Texas course. Uh, the wall was moved because of a previous incident the day before. Oh, I'm telling you, man, he wouldn't let it go. He was like railing against like, no, it was not my fault. The wall. And I am saying I think it was an inch. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Incredible. Well, an inch makes a difference. Yep. That's what she said. Uh, this week's ad is uh, the show is brought to you by Game Time. We love Game Time. We use it all the time. It is uh, GameTime.co is the site, but really want to use the app. Um, look, we've all stressed out. You get excited about a concert. You know, uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers are playing at the yep. Hollywood Bowl, and you want to go, but ticket prices seem ridiculous. You feel like you're getting ripped off. Just wait. Get the Game Time app and watch prices dip as it gets closer to the event. They do these last-minute ticket deals. They're called flash deals, and uh, and it's real easy. You use it. You, it's on your phone. Couple taps. Boom. No printing. No transferring. You've got it. And the app also lets you take a look at the view from the seats. To see if you like it, um, we're talking theater, comedy, rock concerts. How about this, Pally? Uh, right now, sports. L.A. Dodgers. You want to go? Eleven bucks. Look at that. And Face here, value is probably four times that. And here's St. Louis Cardinals. Appropriately, less than half that. Five bucks. That's tomorrow, by the way. <laughs> That's tomorrow wow. when it's five. By by Damn. tomorrow, they're going to pay you to go see the St. Louis Cardinals, Denman. So, and then uh, there they are again, the Los Angeles Sparks, one dollar. Whoa! I would WNBA, wait. I baby. would wait. I think it's going to drop. <laughs> I would wait. <laughs> uh, buy tickets in seconds, and uh, it's the fastest growing app in the country. If you if you find a ticket in the same row and section, Game Time will credit you hundred and ten percent of the difference. So snag the tickets without the stress with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code PAPERS for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account and redeem code PAPERS for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Um, before we get to the front page, which you're doing right now, what is the Denny McCarthy update? Denny McCarthy is now. We are going to become uh, a Denny McCarthy fan podcast partially we're, i think every week we're going to dedicate 60 seconds or so just checking in he's two over for the day which isn't great um but he started he started the day with a four shot lead and then first place uh, this is why i'm bringing it up he was in uh, first place I was what did he shoot the first was he ten he under? He shot a sixty and then a sixty-five. Oh, so he, he almost, almost set broke the course, the course record. record. He missed a putt to not yeah. break the course record of at fifty-nine the first day. Right. So he was up by four shots today, but he's a uh, little tight, little tight. He's he's actually one over <clears> now, so he's four shots off the leader. This is Greg's cousin. Updated. For those who don't cousin. know what we're talking about, and we walked around the course, the uh, Los Angeles, the U.S. Open uh, here in L.A., and we met him, took pictures of him, could not have been a nicer guy. And uh, so uh, we are rooting like crazy for that guy. It was crazy to see that he's not very tall. He's my height. He's like yeah. five foot eight. Yeah. And so, uh, but he's, but he's, he's kind of got a good build. Like he hits the ball as far as anybody. And he is statistically the best putter on the tour. And he's ranked 35th in the world right now. But I think that's about to go down based on the last few weeks. Well, we watched him and every, so he gets on the green and then all of a sudden he becomes a greenskeeper. He walks around it. He then removes 
and uses his putter. It's almost like he's creating a trough to get to the hole. Like he, right. he's tamping it down and making sure there's like no errant like you know moves that the ball is going to make by hitting yeah. a, a leaf or whatever the hell could be there. Yeah. So it's very exciting. Uh, keep an eye on him, everybody. He's a he's one of the top golfers in the league now. Yeah. All right. All right here we go. Front page. There we go, paper. Oh, this is a sad, sad paper to crinkle. Uh, do you want me to do the story? We both put do it, it in. Titanic. All right, this is my headline. The Titanic keeps killing people. The tourist submersible that went missing while carrying five people to the sunken Titanic on Sunday was designated, sorry, designed to be piloted with a video game controller and fitted with off-the-shelf components. The Titan's main compartment has as much space as a minivan. Footage of the vessel showed that its interior could accommodate around five people sitting cross-legged, as well as several screen displays and some camera equipment. We only have one button. That's it. It should be like an elevator. It shouldn't take a lot of skill, Stockton Rush, the CEO of Ocean Gate Expeditions, which conducts the deep sea tours in the, tit the Titan submersible, told Pogue. That was a mouthful. We run the whole thing with this game controller, Rush continued, showing a modified Logitech gamepad controller. It it's literally a video game controller. Um, CBS shot footage of the small space inside the Titan where one can relieve themselves in a bottle. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the crazy thing is $250,000 times. I mean, they're making a million dollars every time they send that thing down. They can't buy a $200 controller. <laughs> also, I mean, is a big part of their bill insurance like are they paying these rich people i like i wonder what's going on yeah now but this is what i do know five rich people died recklessly in a submarine a story the whole world was following meanwhile hundreds of pakistani and afghan migrants died in a capsized fishing boat in the mediterranean and no one gave a shit there were yeah. 100 children in the hull of that boat and they don't know if any of them lived they and nobody and the search and rescue is off of greece the search like they spent five million dollars looking for these five billionaires and meanwhile in greece they sent out like a drone and a couple of jet skis there was no relief effort at all i know it's so it's so crazy yeah you know remember when they heard the knocking so What's that? <laughs> Let's investigate what that knocking is because it wasn't them. <laughs> they imploded yeah. day one, apparently. Right, right, right. Well, you know, anybody who went to go see the Titanic, I can relate because I <laughs> went to see Titanic and I also felt suffocated and I wanted to get the fuck out of there. It felt boring. And, uh, and, and it's like, I can't think of a worse way of dying stuck in an airless capsule with four billionaires. I mean, <laughs> what entitled Karens? They're probably all like, I spent $250,000 for this. This shouldn't be happening. Meanwhile, if you're with poor, I'd rather be with poor people because they would be chill. They'd be like, yeah, bad shit happens all the time. It's should, just Should have seen this coming. I, should, I knew this, you know, and they would probably have a little party. They'd enjoy themselves. They wouldn't be screaming. No country wants us. And we're uh, we're just afloat <laughs> out here. Like, of course, we're gonna die. Yeah. Um, um, well, apparently, the submarine wreckage where the implosion is right near the Titan Titanic wreckage. So this is like rich people dying near other rich dead bodies on Mount Everest. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And and by the way, now there's gonna be more people trying to see the submarine wreckage. So soon it's going to be like a Cadillac ranch of wreckage all around the Titanic. It's just going to, it's going to be like a under underwater city. Yeah. Right. Of right. all these dead millionaire billionaire bodies. And it's going to be the, the children of billionaires are going to be buying their parents tickets so they can get the inheritance. <laughs> Happy father's day. I always knew you love the Titanic. 
Well, uh, you know, there was that one kid who went to a Blink-182 concert when his, I think it was his stepdad is in the submarine. Oh, Oh, really? that, was, that was a big story this week. And he's like, what yeah. am I going to sit around home like and mope and stuff? And uh, uh, Cardi B went after him. It was pretty funny. Oh, you mean he went to the concert after the sub was missing? Yes. Oh, my God. When the search was on, he went to Blink-182. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I wouldn't even go to see Blink-182 if Blink-182 was playing. That's Dick, that's how little I'd go to see them. Dickie sent me, I guess, a Twitter or Instagram video someone met um, where he went, the kids at the Blink-182 concert where are you? Like, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Is that one of their songs? Yeah, and um, <laughs> but just in that in that delivery as well, like, uh, but uh, yeah, he's in jail. He, maybe he's right. He's about to come, become very rich. Maybe who knows? Yeah, right, right. Wow. Yeah. Um, here's another story that got sent to us. You know, you guys are very nice. A lot of times we get emails from people suggesting stories. Oh yeah. And uh, a lot a lot aren't right for the show, but this one came from a bunch of people. Um, a longtime Penn State professor was charged Tuesday after an investigation into trail camera footage showing a man performing sexual acts with a dog. Wow. Perform sounds a kind of aggrandizing for fucking a dog. I mean, did he have one of those orchestra batons while he was sticking his dick in the dog's ass? Curtain drop. There goes a curtain there goes calls, our bows. Yeah. Um, Themis. Matsukas, oh, he's Greek. Oh. 64 of State College was caught on camera April 13th committing sexual acts with his dog near the restrooms of Roth Rock State Forest. There's images depicting Matsukas nude from the waist down, except for socks and shoes. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why that makes me laugh so much, but just. I guess because he's out in the woods and he just feels like, ah, I don't want to be barefoot in the yeah. pine needles. Sometimes you see uh, it's normally a black guy's move in porn. All the, it is. Yeah. I've seen that. Right. Yep. Keeping keeping the socks on. Um, and it is doggy profess- style usually. There we go. The professor of chemical engineering who has been with Penn State since 1991 during that time, he's written several books, published dozens of journal articles, and won at least three teaching awards. Hmm. Uh, here's how you, here's how you keep a dog in place while you're yeah. Uh, he's Themis Metopoulos has been relieved from his responsibilities and is on leave. Said a statement from the university. Uh, he got a, a warrant served, and he was visibly nervous when they served him. Repeatedly told the Rangers, "I'm done. I'm dead. You don't understand." I do it to blow off steam. (laughs) Once I'm done, I'm dead. (laughs) Wait, who said this? The dog? (laughs) The dog is embarrassed. (laughs) I can't I can't look anybody in the crotch anymore. It's ridiculous. Yeah. You get you get the sense that he kept this dog on a leash? (laughs) That that's not a dog you let just walk near you. He'd be fucking gone. Here, boy. Uh, Here, boy. Yeah. Wow. Even even the Penn State, even Jerry Sandusky and Joe Paterno were like, this guy's a fucking pervert. Penn State should be bragging like, hey, kudos to us. We've moved from fucking kids to fucking dogs. <laughs> right? <laughs> Pennsylvania. <laughs> They're acting like Philly out there. <laughs> Animals. And wh- why why we do it in a park? Like you've got a home that's got shades and a locked door. It, did he think it was like romantic? Like the oh well, maybe the dog will be into. It. We'll take a hike first. Yeah, it's I'll like let him sniff around. Guys, like I'm really in the nature. It's like all right, maybe don't be that in the nature. <laughs> like go for a hike, but don't get inside an animal. Like that that's yeah. really back to nature. Yeah. Um, so <clears throat> American students test scores in math and reading got significantly worse last year, Shocker. continuing a decade long free fall. The decline in math stores la- scores last year was the biggest in the past 50 years. Um, it, it's, this is based on a 13 year 
based on 13 year old students average. Um, they say they are now lower than they were before the pandemic. So this is not all blamed on the pandemic. Uh, the declines are among all racial and ethnic groups, among both male and female students across urban, suburban, and rural. Uh, rural. Everybody's dumber. And they say oh, students. Absolutely. They said fewer students are frequently reading for fun, which is associated with higher achievement. They read for fun. I see my kids, captions of Karens on TikTok, stats on Grand Theft Auto, tweets from Chloe and Kim. They read for fun all the time. Yeah, they get a meme summer reading list. I mean, I read. When I was a kid, when I was 13, all I did was read. I read and I smoked pot. That's what I did at 13. No, no, there's no more book clubs. It's just meme clubs. Right. Which is not far from the truth, actually. So kids have gotten dumber, but at least adults have gotten sharper. We elected a, a retired game show host and then an 80-year-old man in a dream state. <laughs> yeah. See how uh, I balanced that out? I Oh, boy, that was very uh, equal opportunity. Uh it of course they're dumber. Um, you know, Neil. I brought him up before, but Neil Postman, uh, who taught at NYU and 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 talked a lot about this. You know, he was seeing it. It's just it's one of his interesting theories was he thought Sesame Street was one of the worst things because what it was trying to do in in large part one of the things was to let children know and to teach children that teaching can be fun. Yeah. And he said, I think that's one of the most damaging things you can teach a child because it is often incredibly rigorous and not fun at all. Learning, learning right. can be very difficult, challenging and really hard on you. And that is when you know you're, you know, you're learning something, you know, that's worth learning and that, it, that it's difficult to grasp at first. And that's what it's about. And if you're teaching them that there should always be at least a little fun or you can make it fun, uh, they're going to check out when it's no longer fun. Yeah. And it's unfair to like, you know, the, uh, I mean, science can be fun. English obviously can be fun. But math, there's just no way to make algebra fun. No, and, any, so, and also, all, science, dude, science, chemistry can be brutal. Sometimes it's just complete memorization. Yeah. Like to become well, a least, doctor. At least with chemistry, there's experiments. But like biology, Jesus Christ, the Krebs cycle. Are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> that was torture. Well, you get to cut open animals. Yeah, that was good. Uh, but yeah, I think, and 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 I'm not blaming all this on Sesame Street. Obviously, I'm just saying that I think people are not doing what they are doing less of what they don't want to do now. Generally, yep, yeah. No, everybody wants to follow their dream, and the dream just coincidentally is always something really easy, like singing or yeah. telling jokes. <laughs> it's never something to better the human condition. Nobody aspires to help mankind. It's all just the dream of me being famous, says yeah. the comedian. I'm podcaster. trying to find him now, and I'm, I'm awful at names and everything, but I think he's like Galway or something like that. But he's very popular on social media, and he was, I think, in advertising and everything. But he's a, he, he's a teacher. I think he might even teach at NYU, coincidentally, just like Postman. But he goes, um, he goes, what kind of like Postman with one of the most damaging things you can tell a kid is follow your dream, like follow your bliss and uh, and your path, find what you're passionate about. And do that. He's like, you want to know who's telling you that? Billionaires who got incredibly lucky. And by the way, how did they make their billions or their millions if they're an influencer in that way? Probably with like natural gas or something they weren't passionate about at all. But yeah. now they're a billionaire and they can do whatever they want, including going in a submarine and checking out the Titanic. So their advice is complete bullshit. And he goes, yeah. what you really should tell kids is try to find what comes more naturally to you, something that you might be good at and go all in on that. Right. I like that. And, yeah. and also... There's nothing shameful about the trades. Like, 
be a carpenter, be a plumber, be an auto mechanic, like paint houses. There's a feeling of satisfaction doing that kind of work that you're not going to get sitting in a coffee shop trying to punch out your fucking screenplay that nobody's going to read. And even if they do, it's never going to get made. Where was this advice when I was a teenager? Right? No, and also, by the way... Perspiration, (laughs) not aspiration. That's my bumper sticker. Huge demand for uh, skilled labor. Huge. Yes. It's getting bigger every day because no one wants to do it. Um, a taqueria chain in California has been ordered by the Department of Labor to pay $140,000 in back pay and damages to 35 employees for hiring a fake priest to elicit confessions from its workers. Oh, my God. Uh, I they, love this. They uh, investigated taqueria Garibaldi uh, in Sacramento. Probably uh, Garibaldi. They, uh, an employee testified in federal court that the restaurant offered employees a person identified as a priest to hear confessions during work hours. The, the employee said the priest urged workers to get the sins out, get, asking workers about sins that only had to do with their employment. Get the poison out. <laughs> the priest asked if I had stolen anything at work, if I was late, or if I did anything to hurt my, hurt my employer. Um, and, and, you know... And they were like, he, he didn't even ask me the details of losing my virginity or how I masturbate. It was really weird. How did they not see this coming? Like, wait a minute. The boss hired you and you're asking me if I've stolen anything? <laughs> yes. Let me tell you straight away. I steal <laughs> yeah. all the time. Right. Boy, I feel better. And this would only happen in a Mexican restaurant where all the employees are devout Catholics. I know. At a Jewish deli, at a Jewish deli, they'd have to send in an undercover Freudian therapist. <laughs> this is so. What's back pay? Because hold on. Oh, there was another part. I cut out some of the article, but they also were not giving back pay to people. Oh, I thought maybe they fired them. Because he, okay, here's the catch: you hire a priest, and oh, you don't. You hire a guy and say it's a priest. And but your employee says yes. I steal about uh, fifteen bucks every night from the register as I'm tallying up the day's uh, tick, and so he gets fired for stealing. That's still uh, that. How do you? What's your opinion on that? You mean should they get fired? Yeah. Well, you have to prove it. You can't have. Oh no, no. F- but like, if you can prove it, but but you got it out of him through like like the law. <clears throat> You know, a police officer can't in like there's you can't entrap, although I know that's a gray area also. But like there are certain rules about how you catch someone. Yeah, no, I think this would be considered what they call hearsay, which means there's no evidence just because you told somebody something. You can't prove that that person wasn't showing off or had an ulterior motive for saying they stole like they'll think i'm cool if i say so there's got to be evidence there's no no be but i'm saying evidence. they give them evidence they go i steal okay. he's like wait a minute i don't believe you i don't think you steal he's like well, no, no i do look <clears throat> here's my bank account and this is how i do it and it's probably on the videotape which i well, erase the, every night the way the way american law works is when you're a uh account manager and or an executive at a company and you get fired <clears throat> There's repercussions because that person can afford a lawyer and has the free time to pursue a major lawsuit. If you're making minimum wage and you get fucked by the letter of the law, you're not seeing anything. Yeah, no yeah, lawyer yeah. is taking your case. I don't know. It reminds me a little of like when they don't, you know, they don't have the exact right search warrant, even though they find stuff. And now the person, right. even though the person's guilty and they caught them, it's how they caught them. And now there are uh, no more charges. Well, this was obviously not in Florida. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I didn't refill the salsa dispenser last week. I also killed my Uber driver and made a bong out of his skull. (laughs) Will you forgive me? Hearsay. (laughs) Hearsay. Uh, Let's go to good news for Gubbins. All right. We kind of already covered it, but... I will also mention that there's been a lot of feedback from people about we talked about taking a week off this summer and letting Dennis Gubbins and Mike Denman take over. 
Maybe the Dan's. Is Mike Denman Chris's brother? Oh, I'm sorry. Chris Denman <laughs> and Dennis Gubbins. The Dan's. Yeah, that's right. The Den Men. The Den Men. And, and some people think it's a great idea. Some people say they will absolutely not listen to it. Um, I think, I don't know. I'm leaning towards it. What do you think? I think the Den Den Papers. I think we got a title. Yeah. The Den Den Papers. I like it. Double Ds. Den, uh, Den of Iniquity. Yeah. I, I love the idea. Okay. So wait, wait what of, week? Do you have a week in mind? I should probably know this. Well, I'm going to Ireland I... and Spain in August from the fifth to like the twentieth, and uh, so it would probably be during that time. Sounds like double double D's. All right, right. <laughs> yeah, and do we have to pay them? Uh, well, I don't. Why would we break format and have this be profitable? Uh, where's that going to come from? Yeah, right. Uh, they can promote their stuff. Yes, that's right. That's right. Um, yeah. All right. Let's let's get to entertainment. You got it. Comedy story. Ever told a joke so bad that a foreign government wants to arrest you? That's the predicament for Singaporean-American comedian Jocelyn Chia after making fun of the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines Flight 370. You remember that? That was like a full 747 went down. Oh, there's a terrible documentary about it. Uh, it's just this reckless documentary entertaining every conspiracy theory. But oh, no she should shit. be in trouble for telling a 10-year-old joke. When, when did that thing go down? All right, anyway, go ahead. So Chia, a former lawyer who was born in the U.S. but grew up in Singapore, was at the Comedy Cellar when she did a bit about the sometimes testy historical relationship between Singapore and Malaysia. Chia joked that Malaysian, quote, airplanes cannot fly, referencing the disappearance of Malaysia Airlines. Uh, after shocking gasps from the audience, she doubled down, joking, quote, Malaysian Airlines going missing, not funny, huh? Some jokes don't land. I love it. I'm launching an investigation into the punchline of that joke. Um, is that what she said? Malaysian police have launched an investigation uh, to on the uh, offensive online content laws. Uh, yeah, I think there should be a lot of investigating of this joke. Yeah, and start with, it happened in 2014. Yeah. That should be your first investigation. Uh, why are you doing a Malaysian Airlines joke now? Right, right. right. And uh, I, th I do think it is always inappropriate to make a joke about something like this. Like, um, you know, like that joke, what does R. Kelly have in common with Malaysian Airlines? They both think they can fly. Oh. Like, that's the kind of thing I don't think should be told. Well, there goes our podcast in Malaysia, Greg. Well... How do Malaysian Airlines serve all their drinks on the rocks? So, like, something like that, yeah. I feel. Yes. What is empty and spins round and round? A Malaysian Airlines baggage claim. That's not comedy. That's not humor to me. That's That should be investigated. Uh, what? I'm, now I'm stealing jokes from the uh, space shuttle. Like, uh, how did you, how do you, how, how do you know that all the Malaysian passengers had dandruff because their head and shoulders washed up on the beach? <laughs> Terrible. Terrible. Yeah. Why didn't they, why didn't they shower before the flight? Well, they figured they'd wash up on shore. So she doubled down with <clears throat> down with, uh, uh, some jokes don't land. I kind of, I respect that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean, I just hate to see we get we get no press. Nobody ever writes about us. We do this thing week in and week out. We're I know, way we're... more offensive <clears throat> than anything this woman has ever said. You can't cancel the canceled. That's what's going on right, with us. That's the key. Me, All right. I'm not going to get me too. Me who? I'm going to get me who'd. Harry and Megan produce a Hollywood flop. 
called themselves. Prince Harry and Meghan's Hollywood foray is looking like a flop. They arrived in Southern California three years ago with Duke and Duchess titles and plans to capitalize on the cash-rich streaming business, desperate for star power to lure subscribers. The big ticket deals that followed, 100 million in Netflix and more Jesus. than and more than 20 million at Spotify have led to more cancellations and rejections than produced shows. Of course, you gave 120 million to some stupid rats. That's what you did. They yeah. had one and, story. You think they, they had more they, than one story? Apparently, like the Spotify podcast, they, they didn't give them anything for like a year, year and a half, and they only gave them like a few episodes after that because they were like forced to. Did they think like Meghan Markle is all of a sudden talented? Something right. she got struck by lightning? She's not a good actress. My kids used to watch that USA show that she was on. I think it was called Suits. She was flat. Oh, I, I don't think she has a charismatic bone in her body. Uh, we both worked for the guy, a total lunatic, but Jim Peratore, uh, God rest his soul, I guess. Um, but he worked with Quincy Jones, and he told me a story once that when he was sitting with Quincy working on, uh, was it Vibe? Whatever it was, a TV show that Quincy was doing. He was in Quincy's office, and he's just looking at the, I think, Oscars and endless Grammys and just all the awards and red gold records and everything everywhere. And he asked him, like, what's the secret of a success? And without even, you know, hesitating, Quincy Jones goes, oh, the, the, the key to success is working with geniuses. And uh, right. I would tell you that Quincy Jones couldn't even help these two idiots. Yeah. That would be a Quincy Jones failure. Um, here's a re here's a reality show that pays you five times that and requires no work. British royalty. Yeah. No network notes, no editing, a PR machine that literally treats you like royalty. She a didn't even. Yeah. A built in stupid audience that believes in fairy tales. She didn't even have one story. I just gave her way more credit because her one story was. Hey, everybody, these guys are racist. Yeah. Really? Oh, great. Thank you. Right, right. Why don't you do a documentary about the Malaysian airline? Why don't you do that? That's been done also. Yeah. Well, let's get to this. Uh, you want to do this Beatles story? Yeah, other British royalty. All right. Sir Paul McCartney says he has employed artificial intelligence to help create what he calls the final Beatles record. Isn't there enough great Beatles stuff? Are you going to put out? This is like when Hendrix died and his estate started finding like audio cassettes in a boom box and putting it out as a fucking record. I know as an um, artist, can you imagine like imagine like uh, I guess the equivalent for us would be like. Oh, hey, we found Mike's uh, Just Shoot Me spec script he wrote when he first moved to L.A. I'm like, right. no, that that didn't get burned is ridiculous. Yeah. Please don't. No one should see that. So he's, he's going to extricate John Lennon's voice from an old demo to complete the song. He said it will it'll be released next year. Um and uh, George Harrison refused to work on the song, saying the sound quality of Lennon's vocals was rubbish. And I guess Yoko Ono wants to add vocals. It's going to be her with electric shock nip, nip, nipple clamps <laughs> so she can harmonize with John's unremitted soul. Oh, lovely. That's what she, her words. Imagine if uh, like AI John Lennon could have been created when John Lennon was alive, you know, or, or even like your version, like, so you, let's just make it simple. So you have the AI robot that looks exactly like you. Right. And, yeah. uh, it's, it's way more talented than you are. And also crazy work ethic, like it, literally 24 hours a day. And also yeah. it would have been telling John, like, uh, what are you doing with her? <laughs> right. Like, why I'll are you with the unattractive <laughs> bad singer? I'll tell you what this John Lennon's not going to do. Shack up with that woman. Uh, uh, it is not going to go well. And hey. uh, and uh, maybe don't move to New York. Maybe go don't. out the back door today. <laughs> <laughs> you slept eight hours again. Do you feel good about that? <laughs> I've written Duck. 74 songs while you napped. 
<laughs> uh, let's do some Florida. All right. Uh, so we got a letter, an email that you showed me. Hey, Greg and Mike, this is from Dan. I saw this article this morning and immediately thought of you, and he sent us, this was on, I think, Tuesday or Wednesday of this week, and he sent us an article about this, uh, the the guy getting bitten in the leg and the uh, the disease spreading around his leg, the bacterial disease. Anyway, he goes, love the show. I haven't missed an episode since the start. You always make us laugh. And my wife refers to you as her friends, Greg and Mike. I think she may have a crush on you. Thanks for nice. putting it out, Dan. Well, he didn't listen last week because we did that story. Yep. So there you go. So we're no longer friends with Mrs. Dan, whoever that is. Um, yeah, I mean, although, look, I'll take a crush over, you know, a little tardy on the episodes. I'll take the crush. No, I know. I'm only giving Dan and the Mrs. some crap. But, uh, no, very sweet. And, yes, we're your friends. We are, of course, your fr- we're everybody's friends. <clears throat> okay, this uh, story I thought was interesting. Not exactly funny, but interesting. Linguists, I would have thought it was linguists, but linguists have identified a new English dialect that's emerging in South Florida. This language variety came about through sustained contact between Spanish and English speakers, particularly when speakers translated directly from Spanish. So some examples are throw a photo instead of take a photo, get down from the car instead of get out of the car. Uh, well, they, if these are if these are Latinos, that probably is because they have an F one fifty pickup with six foot wheels on it. That's why they're getting down from the car. And you're married with like you're married with Aaron. Yeah, I think that's that's better than married to. Yes, you make a yes. Par- you, I like that. It's it sounds more romantic. You're sharing in the marriage. I think it's very similar to make love to versus make love with. I make love at somebody. You, I make love beside somebody. <laughs> I'm usually just self-serving and soothing next to them, and they're usually asleep <laughs> on a park bench. <laughs> and then they scream at me, get down from the car. Uh, make a party, and this is my favorite one. My favorite one, which I think it's, it'll sound so racist if I really, if I really do it, but thanks God. I love thanks God. <laughs> thanks God. That sounds like more Persian. Thanks God. Yeah. Oh, thanks God. He made the birdie putt. <laughs> yeah. But it's also thanks God. I like it. Yeah. Um, some other little di- uh, dialect uh, things that have emerged out of Miami are say hello to my little friend. <laughs> hey, who are you talking? <laughs> who are you talking to? Look at her. She's a thousand and three years old. Here's another one. There's a baby gator in the toilet again. (laughs) I think that has come just out of the Miami area. And then the final one is, and uh, is, I am butt naked because (laughs) here's the Florida man story. What a segue. I am butt naked. A nude Florida man. Uh, says to deputies on high-speed chase after hitting several cars. A Florida fish and wildlife officer witnessed a light blue SUV driving through the intersection, striking multiple vehicles. The officer attempting to pull the driver of the SUV over. He said the driver fled from the intersection at a high rate of speed and uh, went into an elementary school. The driver then entered a landfill before traveling into the wooded area. Deputies found the car stuck against the concrete barrier. They gave the driver and passenger several commands to exit the car, but they both reportedly refused. At one point, the driver can be heard over body cam footage saying, I am butt naked. The driver, 22-year-old Steven Peterson, was removed and can be seen wearing socks. This is a theme, I think, today. Yes. The woman passenger, 20-year-old Victoria Averill, was also forcibly removed from the car. I do not know about her socks. Now, the socks thing reminds me of, do you remember the classic All in the Family episode where Meathead and Archie are arguing about whether or not when you get dressed, you should put on 
your socks and then your shoes, or if you just put on one sock and then that shoe and then the next sock and right. then that shoe. And it was like a 15 minute discussion yeah. on that subject. It was perfect. <laughs> it perfectly like established their characters and, yeah. and, and their arguments for it. Yeah. That was great. I mean, they didn't they didn't say where the socks were. It could have been a red hot chili pepper situation where, <laughs> you know, he was at least partially covered. Um he was having fun and a little distracted, it seems. Yeah. <clears throat> Okay, now make Florida Australia. Is that a paper crinkle? I always forget about that one. In the pre-production meeting, we always discuss, should we crinkle there? New video shows the moment a French woman was attacked by a dingo at a beach in Kagari, Australia. The Queensland Department of Environmental uh, Environment and Science says the animal was humanely euthanized after being involved in a number of, quote, high-risk incidents. Kagari Island in Queensland is home to some 200 wild dingoes. There are strict rules against feeding them with heavy fines. Another dingo was euthanized earlier this month after months of attacks on the island. So just go to YouTube and put in Dingo Bites Woman, I think. Anyway, there's tons of, it's very short, but this dingo approaches this group of pretty attractive young people sunbathing on the beach, goes right up to the hottest woman in a thong bikini, smells her, then smells her ass and starts to like nibble a little. And then she gets incredibly startled. And then she gets up and tries to get away. The dog, the dingo then completely tries to eat her ass. Yes. And you know what the I boyfriend screamed? Dingoes used to go after babies. Now they're going after babes. Yes. A she dingo ate hot. my baby. And he's referring the to his dingo girlfriend. dingo ate my baby. A dingo ate my booty. <laughs> Why? Apparently <laughs> Australian people have Miami accents. A dingo ate my booty. Do you remember what a big deal that movie? Wasn't it a made-for-TV <clears throat> movie about the dingo taking the baby? Yeah, I mean, it's... It's crazy heartbreaking, but I think that line was so outlandish. It was almost like, I, I want to say it kind of gave, in a weird way, like it kind of gave birth to like snakes on a plane or yeah. or like a sharknado. Like it's such a crazy thing. A dingo ate my baby. I mean, I'm making, that's a little bit of a leap, my logic there, but that line was not supposed to be that iconic, I don't think. No, but but it, also just the idea that that I mean, when we were kids in the 70s, there was like roots. There was Dingo Ate My Baby, which I think was another made for TV <laughs> miniseries. There was the Holocaust. Remember the Holocaust series? No, I don't. Yeah, that was I don't think that series. I don't too. think that series ever happened, Greg. <laughs> <laughs> That's propaganda from the left. Yeah. Um, All right. We got sports. We already talked. Oh, well, what's the update? I'm Denny. Well, let's do a little crinkle. Oh, yeah. Denny is, he was, he was 10 under the first day, five under the second day, and now he's two over today. So he's dropped back about six places and he no. is, two, yeah, he's two over for the day. Um, he's 15 holes in. You know, he's not, it's not impossible, but him winning is pretty unlikely at this point. But you know what? Top 10 finish puts him in a lot of money. He Last week, he was 20th at the U.S. Open. He won $250,000. So he'll be making more than that this week. And, uh, he you went know, move up in the rankings. He went ten under the first day. He could do that tomorrow. It's the same golf course. You right. know what? I, you know what I learned because I don't know a lot about golf at all. But I did see like when we were paying attention to the U.S. Open here in L.A. Just they're like, oh, you want to get out there in the morning? Like I guess everyone knows greens are slower because they're still damp or whatever in the morning. They haven't baked under the sun and dried out, and and you could see. Uh, was it what's his name in the U.S. Open who had that crazy start and then Fowler and then because I guess when you're leading the tournament 
you go out last on the last day. Yes, yes. And he struggled like crazy. And yeah. then and then they would they talk about front nine versus back nine. Of course, that was the difficulty of the course. But it also was later when they were playing the back nine. And like so, anyway, there's all these things I don't know. But um, maybe because he did so well the first day, does he go out later the second day? I'm trying to explain yeah, what's off. happening. Yeah, he teed off at the end. That's what happens. The the, the leading players go out at the end. So, yeah. uh, you know, we'll see. All right, let's get to some international. You got it, pal. Uh, a 76-year-old woman who had been declared dead and surprised her relatives by knocking on her coffin during her wake earlier this month has died after seven days in intensive care. Bella Montoya initially had been admitted with a possible stroke, and when she did not respond to resuscitation, a doctor on duty declared her dead. (laughs) On June 9th, Montoya reportedly woke up and started knocking after spending five hours inside the funeral home. Knock, knock. Who's there? Bella. Bella who? Bella, get me out of this fucking coffin before I suffocate. (laughs) She's sort of the human version of this submarine. Like, they heard knocking, everybody had hope, and then they're all dead. (laughs) That's right. That's right. (laughs) Although, Although when they got her out of the coffin, she said that she... She had an outer body experience, and she saw the Titanic. <laughs> yes, she saw that the, the orchestra was playing on the deck, and did they? Leonardo DiCaprio was getting laid with a twenty-one-year-old extra. Did they bury her at sea? Maybe that's the knocking they oh, heard. Oh yes, that's what it was. She's a knocker. Wherever you put her, she knocks. <laughs> oh Bella, <laughs> we miss you, Bella. Ah. Um, all right, let's get down to this day in history. Oh, man, yes. We are flying today. On June 25th, 2009, Michael Jackson uh, died at the age of 50 in L.A. after suffering from cardiac arrest caused by a combination of drugs given by his personal doctor. In 93, he was accused of molesting a 13-year-old boy who had been a sleepover guest at his home. You know, sleepovers. Jackson denied the allegations, and it was dropped. However, he later settled for $20 million. Mm. And then in 2003, he was accused of molesting another boy. He was a, There was a trial. He was acquitted. And uh, and then it was reexamined in that uh, documentary, Leaving Neverland. Did you watch that? Oh, yeah, I watched it. They were yeah. very believable. Yep. He, yeah. in- he, he then faced intense scrutiny over his radically altered physical appearance, lighter complexion, plastic surgeries. Uh, part of this was because he was disfigured in uh, shooting a Pepsi commercial when he burst into flame. So I guess that was a thing. Um, you know, I, I think I've told it before, but I had like a little inside information on it from someone who knew his famous attorney. And maybe if I don't say the famous attorney, uh, but anyway, I, and people can fact check this, I guess. Uh, cause you know, there's a tremendous amount of supporters who are incensed that anyone is suggesting that he slept with little kids, but, uh, Apparently, they were very strategic. It was like, you know, an all-star uh, defense team. And I guess the most damning thing was um, two kids drew, were asked to draw his genitals. And he had a distinguishing characteristic. And I guess that they were unbelievably, ac- you know, like uh, similar. And what they did, though, is they bought out and buried uh, and, and made it, um, I don't know any of the legal terms, but they basically removed from the legal system one of the kids, like whether it was, I think that's one the one they settled, and that oh, might right, right. that might have been the maid's son or something like that, the cleaning woman's son. But by doing that, they didn't care about the other one because it was no longer corroborated. Yeah. It was just hearsay or whatever it was. I still don't know why they couldn't have gotten in trouble because if it's an accurate drawing, but, um, anyway, I think, 
I, I wouldn't mind being fact checked on that. This is what I do know about Michael Jackson's death. I'm at Tosh.0, first season, and we are shooting a web redemption about a guy who crawls, he gets into balloons, some, you know, some weirdo. And we are in the middle of shooting it, but our show airs that night. And we were week to week. Like it was, we were going to get canceled season one. And we needed ratings. And this Tosh.0 aired on Thursday nights. June 25th, 2009 was a Thursday I get the alert, everyone's phones blew up, that Michael Jackson died, and I was like, we're fucking done, because nobody is watching Tosh.0 tonight. Everybody is watching the news. Right, right. And that was it? You got canceled? No, it went on for 11, 12 seasons, but that Thursday was our absolute lowest rating, but it was low ratings for everybody, so they kind of didn't count it against us. Wow. Yeah. I bet his Spotify account blew. Was Spotify around in 2009? No, I don't think it was. I don't think. He probably had album sales go up. Oh, of then. course. So yeah. he was married to Lisa Marie Presley for less than a year. Yeah. And then he married this other uh, beard, uh, who is the mother of, his, uh, of two of his children who look nothing like him. Yeah. And uh, he was... Basically, they call this a homicide because there was lethal lethal lever, levels of propofol and other drugs in his system. Uh, more than 20,000 fans attended a public memorial at the Staples Center. Over 30 million viewers tuned in to watch the event on cable TV. Um, guess who? Don't look at the notes. Okay. Guess who is was the largest funeral in history, in the world. Who was the largest funeral? Yeah, the most people turned out for. Gandhi. Very close. Closer okay. than you can imagine. Uh, because it was an Indian who you have never heard of. Marco Polo. <laughs> His name was C.N. Anadurai, oh. and he was the chief minister... And I guess he was also like a writer, but he must have been very popular because 15 million people showed up for his funeral. Wow. Yeah. Uh, Isn't that weird? I didn't hear. So wait, how did you get to that stat? How many were at Michael Jackson's? 20,000. Oh, because it was in a Staples Center. Yeah. But there were a lot but, uh, outside and all that. I mean, yeah, maybe they didn't count the people outside. but uh, I mean, I'm not saying it doubled it, but I... But the Guinness Book of World Records is where I went. Uh, wait, Denny's putting for birdie. What's he going to do? What's he going to do? Oh, fucking missed it. Came off on the weak side. Um, all right, let's get huh. to letters to the editor. Okay, pal. A lot of letters. Sorry oh. we've been a little remiss in getting to them all, but David Goldfarb wrote in and he said, uh, I decided that you guys should, uh, the next Sunday paper's item to sell. Oh, this is the merch idea. Um, uh, huh. This is so poorly written. The car, the car tree. Uh, the cartoon image of Greg and Mike that is hanging up behind Greg's office uh, I thought about getting that printed. It seems like a lot of work. Maybe you guys could make it easier for me and offer that car- cartoon image on a T-shirt. Maroon sounds like a good color for the shirt itself. That's for Brian Maley. Ah, that's not a bad idea. No, the guy uh, up top though, Goldfarb. He, I or no, uh, someone. Oh, that was David Goldfarb wrote that. Oh, uh, Meg Hopper suggested a small, flat, uh, cheap idea, which is a car tree. Those things that hang from your uh, wind. You know, oh, yes, I love that. Do people use that though? Fuck yeah! They smell terrible. Yeah, that's true. Um, Brian Maley, as well as Jordan, as well as David Fison, as well as about twelve other people. We asked about rolling papers, custom made. There's a place called rollyourownpapers.com that they all recommended. We could do rolling papers because somebody else was worried about us adding to landfill. No landfill with rolling papers. <laughs> Don right. Gilroy said three low cost and low shipping items a divot tool with a custom logo ball marker for golf, a golf towel 
or a head cover. We do talk about golf a lot. I know. I'm a, I'm a little embarrassed at this point. Yeah. Uh, but I don't know. Would there be demand for uh, a logo on? Well, we could do that in addition to other stuff. Right. Uh, Susan Carlson says, pillowcases, silkscreened image of your mugs peering over the Sunday paper. Uh, I haven't seen a podcast selling pillowcases. I wonder so, why. So, um, you know. It sounds like a terrifying thing in the middle of the night. You wake up and our two faces are right, bet- <laughs> right surrounding your face. And I don't want you drooling on my face. I get or... where she's going. This this chick humps pillows. I get it now. That's right. I see what's happening. When her boyfriend's doing a little doggy on her, she slides it under her pelvis <laughs> to give him a better shot at the goods. Oh, man. Okay. She said, also those sun guards for your car's dashboard. Yeah, that's okay. that's a big, that's a large item. Yeah. All right, let's cut down to this. Matt Turfrey. I think he's Australian. He said, regarding cunts oh. in Australia, if you are a tradie, tradesman, like a welder, everyone is a cunt. Uh, there are only different levels of cunts. There are good cunts, funny cunts, bad cunts, stupid cunts. The one true cunt is a dog cunt, lowest of the low. Hope this helps, cunt. And then there's cunty cunts. By the way, we wonder why our podcast doesn't get more listens. It's because we never get in the algorithm because all you have to do is say cunt once and you are just pushed aside and you get no traction whatsoever. So saying it seven times doesn't remedy the issue? <laughs> I don't issue? think so. All right. I don't think so. Or making Holocaust jokes. I mean, we really check all the boxes for YouTube just to take us down. The Germans were cunts. That should fix everything we just said. All right, this is a long one, but it, it's kind of interesting. From okay. Brian, we were talking about Mary Shelley writing Frankenstein. Yes. Uh, you've probably heard the story about how Mary Shelley, quote, wrote Frankenstein on vacation in Geneva. She was there with Lord Byron, his mistress, and the doctor, John Polidari. That summer in Europe was incredibly cold due to the eruption of Mount Tambora, which was the deadliest volcanic volcanic eruption in history caused 100,000 deaths and at least a million people died of starvation due to smoke blocking the sun and killing crops. Uh, Tens of millions more died from cholera that broke out. Uh, So they were stuck inside during their vacation. To pass the time, Byron challenged them to a game where they would each write a ghost story every night. So being the ultimate overachiever, she spent the whole summer creating only one story, which became the novel Frankenstein creating supposedly the science fiction genre in the process. It's, it's um, You really cannot underestimate what an impact it had. Now where now here's where it gets interesting. A few years before that trip, Mary Shelley's stepmother received a letter from Jacob Grimm. That sound familiar? Grimm Grimm's Brothers. Tales? Yeah. So she worked, f- who she worked for as a translator. The letter told her of a story that he and his brother came across that was too dark to put in their famous collection of fairy tales. The story was, quote, The Magician and the Monster, about a magician who dug up corpses, sewed them together, and reanimated them in his castle. Which castle, you may ask? Castle Frankenstein. Come on now. So while Shelley got the credit for creating science fiction, the real credit should go to the Grimm brothers uh, or the German peasant they took the story from. While on the subject of stolen credit, John Palladori later killed himself after the story he wrote on that trip about a vampire from Romania that moves to England was stolen by one of his patients named Bram Stoker. Take it each, Brian. Yep. Yep. It sounds like he should have killed Bram. Right. Oh, man. Uh, so, I mean, you think about thievery today. I wonder today, if this is all true. It's a lot harder to steal today because, you know, you got the internet and people are checking on stuff and they're posting if something's stolen. And, I mean, I, there's, a, there's a number of comedians whose careers have completely ended because of thievery. You, you worked for one of them, Carlos Mencia. And yep. uh, so you wonder if that's not a good. Po- I mean, granted, there's also assholes that like I'll post without a doubt. 
I'll post a joke on Twitter and somebody will go, thief, that's fucking Jim Bozo from Minneapolis's joke. Yeah, yeah. I follow Jim. That's yeah. where I get my jokes. Right. So there's that, but there's also a policing element to it that's probably good in the long run. I Did Jacob Grimm really write Mary Shelley's stepmother a letter detailing? I mean, I, I want to look into this, of course, the magician and the monster. Let's go down that rabbit hole. I think there's something there. I think we're going to find something there. Uh, uh, Seth she, well, Bedrol she did a lot with it. I'll, I'll tell you that. She did a lot with it because it was really, I mean, I don't know if that was in the story, but, you know, the whole meet your maker, which was so well done in Blade Runner, you know, is yeah. all from that. It's like, you're, you created me. It's kind of like, I don't know why more people who believe in God aren't angry at God. Like, well, what the fuck? Like, was there a plan here? You yeah. made me. You know what right. I mean? Right. Well, is there... Um, I don't know. It, 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 it feels like, you know, science fiction, those, those ideas are almost like folklore. Like you hear those kind of um, archetypal stories about creating a monster and, you know, and it, it being, it being an, a, a, a metaphor for God. So I don't know. Maybe that was floating around in in you know Bavaria for centuries before it got written down. Right. Um, all right. Here is Seth Bedro who says we should get Andy Kindler involved in oh. guest hosting Sunday papers. That's interesting. That's very interesting. Um, we love Andy. Congrats again for Owen. You've raised a great kid, and he's going to live a good life. Thank you, Seth. Um. And then, all right, let's get down to... Oh, he talks about, he went back to that when Andy was on, and it was, I had I had said, you sound like you're in, like, a, a, whatchamacallit, in jail, in prison, in solitary. And he was doing a hack comedian alone in an asylum, and it was so, I remember he's detailing it here. It's yeah. so funny. Yeah, maybe we should get him on with the with with the dens. Get him in the den. Get him in the den, den. Um. All right, and then uh, let's get down to. Oh, there is someone's giving me credit. Where? Uh, Greg and Mike love the show. Mike is right about Hobart. Hobart was the dominant Division Three lacrosse team, winning 15 out of 18 and 12 straight national championships. Uh, they stupidly moved to Division One in '95 and have become a mediocre at best. As for Jim Brown, his credit is huge in the sports history, but, but they changed NCAA changed rules because of his dominance. Uh, oh, the length of the stick has to be a minimum of 40 inches. Now he played with a shorter stick, which was harder to check. This is lacrosse. Uh, yeah. Anyway, uh, very cool. Yeah. People love you, Mike. The crease of the goal used to be square in lacrosse. I didn't know this. He would jump over the corners to his advantage. They changed the crease to a circle. <laughs> wow. Um, all right. And that's all, folks. Here's the obituaries. Speaking of sports, Homer Jones was a Pro Bowl wide receiver for the Giants and the inventor of the NFL touchdown spike. Wow. Yes, he was uh, hailed from Pittsburgh, Texas, played for Southern Texas Southern College. Um, started his pro career with the Houston Oilers. Um, so he got a, so his his speed helped him dominate from sixty six to sixty eight. He had twenty eight touchdowns and a thousand receiving yards in each season. Um, so the, his most notable legacy is the touchdown spike. Starting at sixty five, the NFL had begun to find players who threw the ball into the stands after a touchdown. After an eighty nine yard touchdown pass against the Philadelphia Eagles, Jones was just about to hurl the ball into the stands when he stopped himself and threw it to the ground instead. The crowd went wild and the spike was born. Wow. Yeah. I like it. I didn't know that. I didn't know they could track it to one guy. You don't see people spiking the ball the way they used to. Do you get fined for spiking now? You see the you see the twist. 
They they dreidel yeah, spin maybe it. Maybe you do. But you know, rugby is a touchdown. Like you the ball has to hit the ground in the end zone. Right. Right. Uh with possession though, you have to be holding it. Yeah. I think All right, let's cut, cheer. I mean, let's... that's touchdown. Yes, right? All right. Right. Let's cheer up after that. That wasn't too depressing, but all right. It's the Sunday funnies. <laughs> And uh, Loretta is talking to her friend who's dressed in all maroon. And Leroy is on the couch Looks in purple. his socks. He's got his socks on. And yeah. he's uh, he's napping hard. He's down. And Loretta goes, Leroy's never been self-conscious. First, you have to be conscious. Ah, uh, look at that. Yeah. Uh, now there's a board meeting. And yeah. the uh, head of the company is at, in the conference room. And uh, he's reading through what looks like a bunch of ballots in front of five employees. And the guy says, three votes for standing desks, two for regular desks, and one from Leroy for recliners. That's not that strong. It's not the, it wasn't a strong week for the Lockhorns. No. Uh, well, thank God Hagger's here to cheer us up. Yeah. Uh, he's at a dress store. And the woman says to him, I'm sorry, sir, but we don't have any dresses in your wife's size. Hagger holds up a bag of gold, and he goes, okay, I guess I'll take my gold elsewhere. Final frame, woman in her underwear as Hagger walks out the door with her dress. Now, the question is, was she raped? I mean, you don't get down to your underwear in front of a Viking in the 15th century and expect nothing's going to happen. Ex- and for and she's not getting the gold either. Come on. I can't even believe he paid for anything, to tell you the truth. Yeah, yeah. That's not his way, usually. She's got a smile on her face, though. I mean, maybe, uh, maybe she wasn't. Even if he didn't rape, he didn't even pillage. Yep. What kind what? of Viking is this? There has to be pillagery. Or whatever yeah. you call it. Okay, here's the far side. Uh, we got a giant dinosaur head, and uh, it's like a T Rex, <laughs> and he's eating this guy who's in a round, like spaceship looking thing. And you can see the writing <clears throat> on the side, and it said, Bob's Rent a Time Machine. <laughs> And the guy's screaming his head off. <laughs> he's going down the throat <laughs> of a T Rex. Yes. But it, it did remind me of that uh, Louis, C, Louis C.K. bit, which is great, that only white people would get in a time machine that right. went that went back. I think it moved, that goes anywhere, but that goes back in time. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. it backfired on this poor gentleman. You know, I read some dumb thing, like maybe it was an Instagram thing that came up of like facts that would surprise you. And it was... I think they said George Washington. Um, the 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 world had no knowledge of dinosaurs in George Washington's time. Huh. But I'm wondering how late it went. Like, what was so? Did it happen right after George Washington died? Is that why they name him? Like, did Lincoln know about dinosaurs? Hmm. Interesting. Other than George Washington. Um. Yeah. So anyway. Speaking of dinosaurs, you should have seen the lineup at the Laugh Factory last night. Could it buzz to ding? No Blondie this week, and I'll and there was no Blondie last week, and I'll tell you why. I'll tell you why. Okay. Because Dean Young sucks. He every fucking strip for two weeks is all about Dagwood. It's called Blondie. Oh Dean. boy. Oh, I don't boy. give a shit about Dagwood at the local uh, diner having a stupid conversation with the cook or Dagwood at the water cooler making a stupid remark or sleeping on the couch while the next door neighbor boy wants to play football with him. It's boring. I want to see tits and ass. I want to see sex. I want to get turned on. I want to masturbate, (sighs) Dean. What are you doing to me? (sighs) God. Yeah, goddamn him keeping you from that. And I can't look at old ones because I've already spunked it out to those so many times. Oh, There's boy. nothing left. There goes the algorithm. We're never getting it there back. There goes the algorithm. Spunked it out. All right. Oh. All right. Well, listen. Yeah. Do, do I, I didn't plug my dates. 
I forgot to plug my dates. Let me do it now. Go to Pottstown, PA to see me at Soul Joel's on July 21st. And then the next night and the night after that, I will be at Point Pleasant, New Jersey. Uncle Vinny's. Yeah. So come on out. And uh, I'm going to play golf with Rich Voss. He's going to come down and see me. Maybe oh, see uh, Joey cool. Diaz and Dan Brickner. I'm going in a night early and hanging out with Dan Brickner. Uh, for a couple I'm days. jealous. That's great. Yeah. It's going to be fun. Uh, Anything you want to promote, Mike? Well, did you see the curious case of Natalia Grace yet? No. And I'll tell you why I'm not going to see it. Oh. Oh. Because I don't get what fucking channel it's on. I'm not getting Pluto TV or no, whatever. No, no, you're right. It's so difficult. It's on. it's on it's on an app. It's very, very weird. It's called Max. Yeah. It's like No, it's not on Max. It's the largest second, third largest app for entertainment in the world. When I looked it up, it was not on Max. It's on all right, Max. I'll, I'll, all right, I'll check again. Now I'll check again. The thing is so reckless as a documentary that I was like, how did this come out of HBO, but it didn't, which is the whole idea of Max, which is uh, Max now includes everything from Discovery. You know, the parent the parent company right. owns HBO, they own Discovery, they own Turner. And so this came from a TV show, because you could tell where the commercial breaks are, um, that was Discovery, I believe, but it wasn't from HBO documentaries. Okay. But it's a crazy one. And then I've been watching Black Mirrors. And what, oh, yeah. And then I watched something else I wanted to talk about. I'm trying to remember what it was. Oh, did I talk about the volcano couple? No. Because the that ones volcano that go couple. Chase, they chase volcanoes? The, the volcano uh, that you mentioned in that Mary Shelley um, letter that was written in. Um, yes, it's, it's called Fire of Love. And I didn't even watch i like fell asleep towards the end it, it, i mean it's okay but it, you should check out some of it it's this couple who was nominated for an oscar the documentary and it's this couple who in the 60s i think met they were both obsessed with volcanoes and became kind of the jacques cousteau of volcanoes and they would be alerted when one's about to go off and they'd rush there but you see you just have to tune in for the style of it it is completely Wes Anderson 40 years before Wes Anderson. Oh, no shit. With the cute hats and all the, the framing. Yeah. And they would like, they were shooting film, obviously, like Super 8 and stuff. And it's really interesting to see that. Wow. What yeah. channel is it on? Beatbox.com? That one, where did I find that one? Uh, Amazon or Netflix? It's a biggie. It's a biggie. Okay. No, Disney. Can't wait to see it. It's on Disney. All right. One, we should have we should have pointed out Chris Denman was obviously not with us today. He is, uh, I believe, there's a fundraiser for Kyle Rittenhouse today, and he's over he's over in Michigan for that. Yep. So yeah. we'll see him next week. And uh, it's a thank GoFundMe because it's fun. Uh, carrying, what do you say? It's it's a GoFundMe because it's firearms are fun. Firearms are fun. That's what I he always what he says. says. Yeah. And we want to thank the other people at Midcoast Media, Beth and Key and John and everybody who makes the show possible. Thank you so much. And uh, I promise to pay you. I owe you some money. And can't and, wait to uh, get the new mics. And we're getting some new mics. All right. So we'll see you guys next week. I'm the old mic. All right. Take it, Ish. Take it, Ish. Clapping back again. Mike starts to speak. Great cuts in. We know how to tell a friend. Papers time will never end. Papers time with Greg and Mike. Gonna tell you all about it. Gonna tell you what you like. Floor it up, man in a cement mixer dies. Joan thinks she has a crush on you guys. Listeners mail in corrections. Cartoon tits give Greg erections. Florida man in its necrophilia. Denman loves Nazi memorabilia. I hope it's something that you'll like. It's Sunday papers with Greg. Yeah.